Your hands together for Pastor Wilfredo de Jesus, Pastor Choco. God bless you. Welcome to New Life Pilsen. Thank you. Oh, may the Lord bless you. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what an honor for those who are watching online across this city as the Lord begins to move in your heart and uh, to research. Uh, before I get into my teaching tonight, just want to thank Rob and Jolie. Um, just being here tonight, uh, Belfort, just seeing what God is doing. I'm really just excited for you, both of you. Um, you know, regardless of what I say other than this, <laughs> I just think that uh, amazing, amazing what God is doing. And uh, when you called about it and coming, I wanted to be here and just to see and to support you and, and believe in Jolie and you and, and here in Pilsen. I know we don't get a chance to see each other a lot, but man, keep, keep tearing down the walls. Keep reaching the city for Jesus. Put your hand to the plow. Keep plowing. <laughs> Diana, where's Diana? Stand up, baby. Stand up. Come on, give me a hug. This girl's leading worship. I love this girl. No, you don't get a hug. Then Jolie get a hug, and Via got a hug. Magdalena got a hug. I'm still praying about your hug and see what the. <laughs> Hey, I greet you. My wife uh, was not able to come, and, and so we greet you. Elizabeth greets you all. Um, Belford mentioned my children, Alex. She's married. Jesenia is getting married July 18 next year. So pray for me. Still, you know, still getting over Alex's deal. And, but anyway, they're doing well. Papito's in Atlanta um, doing master's commission. This is his second year in leadership and uh, teaching out there. Uh, going after his credentials with the Assemblies of God. Uh, so those, that's what things are going on at New Life. We are, um, we've got three more churches that added to this family. we got two more churches in Colorado that have joined New Life Covenant Churches, that have become New Life Covenant Churches. <clears throat> We're excited about that. And just what God is doing in general uh, through the fellowship and the ministry here, in the city of Chicago, but around the world, around the world, through New Life Covenant, in Jesus' name. I want to give you a word. I want to give you a word. I think Belford invited me to come on a Saturday night because he knows I don't speak long. and knows that, you know, we got four services tomorrow. But I'm going to, I want to bring your word before you leave. Quiero traerle una palabra antes que se vayan. Creo que Dios está haciendo algo en nuestro país y en nuestra ciudad. Y que Dios está buscando hombres y mujeres. God is looking for men and women that would stand in the Ibanayim to stand in the gap. Open your Bibles with me to Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. Ezekiel chapter 22, uh, verse 30. And to all the other guest speakers that came, I uh, had the opportunity to meet them in the, in the green room. What a pleasure seeing you again, brother, and meeting you and your lovely wife and so thank you for investing in the city of Chicago here with Robert and uh, Jolie. Praise the Lord for you guys. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. When you have it, say amen. This is the prophet. He's, a, he's, in, he's heading towards captivity. He's in prison. And God himself is saying these words. And I think these words are relevant in the time we live in, here's what God says. I look for a man among them who will build up the wall. Now, when you look up the word wall, you think about, well, you know, the, the drywall. No, we're talking about standards. We're talking about moral values. We're talking about when you think about the walls. When Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of the city of Jerusalem... What, what was happening was that there was a, a, a decay, there was a decadence. The, the temple was built, but the walls were left in ruins for 141 years. 
What value is it that the temple is built, that the altar is built, but they're exposed to sin? God says, I look for a man among them who will build up the standard, the wall, and stand before me in the gap. Everybody say gap. In the gap. The word gap here in Hebrew means Ibanayim. Ibanayim means between two places. So let's back up. I look for a man among them who will build up the standard, who will stand before me in the Ibanayim on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. And here's what God says. But I found none. I didn't find not one person in this city who would be willing to risk their life, to risk their character, their reputation for the people. And God said, I looked among them. And when God looks, he looks. The Bible says that the eyes of God look to and fro to see whose heart is fully committed to him. And then God himself, that's a sad day on the planet earth, when God himself says, I didn't find anybody. Everybody was busy doing their own thing. People were just running for their lives. Nobody cared about the people. Watch this, watch this. When we think about gap, church, when we think about gap, we think about a place of weakness, if you're taking notes. Place of weakness, a, a place of vulnerability, a place of exposure, a, a, a place of danger. When you stand in the gap, you are exposing yourself to the attacks of the enemy. Are you with me? When you stand in the Ibanayim, you're saying that there is a need. And I have to say something. I have to stand before and defend the voiceless, the marginalized. Got to do something. I just can't live on planet earth and let everything go on and, and, and not do anything about it. I got to do something with this gospel that's in my life, right? Jesus even said that if you try to preserve your life, you lost it. But if you lose your life for me, in other words, if you stand in the gap for me, you found it. Found what? Found purpose. You found reason. You found purpose. New life, churches. There's a tsunami coming to America. There's a moral decadence coming to our shores. Walls have been destroyed. Standards have been destroyed. We see it. Look at me. And those are watching on the internet. We see it. We hear it. But we're not moved to it. We, we, don't, we don't perceive the danger that's happening in our society. There's a decay. There's a breaking down of walls of our lives. And we're not moved to it. We've got a good temple. We've got a good altar. Yet the city around us is destroyed. People's lives. Broken down systems. Broken of families. Brokenness. Yet God says, God says, He is Yahweh God. He is our protector. He is our rear guard. He is our champion. He's the giver of victory. When you stand in the Ibanayim, when you stand in the gap for other people. I'm only in the introduction, so praise the Lord. In 1950, in 1950, President Eisenhower, who is not really a particularly religious guy in the 50s, he went on TV before the Russians for the G Geneva Peace Conference with the Soviets. He went on national TV, watch this. He went on national TV and urged everybody to go to church and pray for peace. That type of gesture in the 1950s was routine back then. But today, in the year 2014, it's unimaginable. Watch this. In a short time, we have gone from defining culture, being the culture, to be not a step uncool, frequently mocked, ignored counterculture. I got news for you all. We're no longer the majority here in the United States. The Christians are no longer the majority. As a matter of fact, we're in the minority. We are now part of a culture that's out of step. 
Watch this. How do we adjust from being the culture to being a counterculture minority group? Hey, church, we need to stop caring what people think about us and start caring about what God thinks about us. We need to stop letting Hollywood defend who we are. Hollywood cannot define who you and I are. Most Americans see Christians as judgmental, hypocritical, moralistic. But it's up to you and I to start showing the nation that we are a community of love and a community of forgiveness. Offering transformation to the brokenhearted. God says, I look for somebody, an Ish and an Isha. Somebody who was standing in the Ibanayim and I didn't find anybody. Every reader, every reader of mainstream media knows that Christians are against gay marriages. But how many know that Christians are equally against divorce and adultery and child abuse and domestic violence? These are issues that you and I stand for. These are the wars that I'm talking about that have been broken. Watch this. Oh, how many Americans know that the church is a place where you can come and find love for the entire community? The United States of America, highest record level of poverty ever. Four out of five people come to grips with joblessness and poverty and depend on welfare. In the United States, in the time that you and I live in right now, four out of five, thank you for the water, Four out of five people come to grips with joblessness. One out of five American children tonight will go to bed hungry tonight. Homelessness impacts millions. The average homeless person in America is not 32 years old. is nine years old. Our education system is on the decline. Hey, church, don't be deceived. The decay is not only economic, but it's also moral. You hear me? We used to, a decade ago, we used to be outraged as an as a institution, as a church. We used to be outraged by abortion. Now millions of babies are murdered in this country daily, every 20 seconds. And it doesn't concern us anymore. We have become a church that now flows with the current. Watch this, watch this. Ten years ago, ten years ago, rates of domestic violence and pornography didn't move us to act. Now maybe thousands of young girls who are victims of human trafficking will move you. The average girl that's being trafficked is 12 years old. Right now we're working with the FBI to go to Arizona for the Super Bowl. We're sending buses of people from our church to deal with the... Human trafficking. Did you know that during the Super Bowl here in the United States, 100,000 girls are being trafficked? And God said, I look for someone who will stand in the Ibanayim. Here, 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 listen, listen. With revelation comes responsibility. Once you have been revealed something in your society, in your community, you, mo you must act. When the moral condition of your community has been revealed, God says, I look to see if you will act with that. That's why we're going to Arizona. That's why last year we were, we were in Dallas. Our buses of women went out there just for three days, didn't sleep well, just hitting the streets, going to hotels and motels, trying to rescue these girls from trafficking. God said, I look for someone. Who was standing the Ibanayim. And I didn't find anybody. But if we are now the culture that had become uncool. We have been the culture that they don't want us to speak out as a church. What used to be an issue of abstinence and safe sex. Is now questioned about sexual orientation for our young people. What used to concern us about prayers in school has become recklessness among young who no longer fear God. In the 1950s, 73% of high school students feared God. In the year 2000, 
4%. Have no respect for authority or God. What are you saying, Pastor Choco? There's a moral decadence in our society. And there must be a resurgence. There must be where the church must rise again to the forefront of our society. Come on, give him praise and glory. Every year we're deporting 300,000 people from our nation. God said, I look, pick, pick. Is it, if it's homelessness, if it's issue with human trafficking, whatever it is, pick, pick a gap. They're all over the place. You don't need to look too far. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to pray about it. Just stand. <laughs> right? Because prayer, listen to me, church, we can no longer use prayer as a crutch not to do anything. Now, I believe in prayer. We're in a 24-hour prayer right now in our church. Why? Because we feel that a battle is coming. And we better be ready for what's coming to the shores of America. We better be ready. And it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We better be ready for what's coming to the shores of America. Prayer is good. But that prayer must convert to action. Now, we like football. How many like football here? American football. How many like the Bears? Pray for Detroit. Pray for those people. In the NFL, in the NFL, they give you, if you don't know the, the rules of football, the NFL gives you 25 seconds how many here say, Pastor Choco, I don't know anything about the rules of NFL. Raise your hand. How many do not know? Okay, let me pray for you right now. Father, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what they're watching on Sunday. All right, let me help you out. There's 11 people on one side, and there's 11 people on the other side. It's called the defense and the offense. In the offense, they have the ball. When they have the ball... The NFL says we give you 25 seconds to get in a circle and call a play. If you don't call a play within 25 seconds, the referee blows the whistle and says delay of game. And they get penalized five yards. They got to move back. Because in the circle, they were talking too long. When? When? When would the church of Jesus Christ break huddle? When will, we, when will we break huddle and say we got to get to the line of scrimmage and we got to, and there's going to be opposition coming our way because the devil's not going to take this lightly. God has given the church a mandate to go out and preach the gospel. God has given this church a mandate. You're in a huddle, but you got 25 seconds. You must call a play and move this gospel forward. Oh, come on. I wish I had somebody here that knows what I'm talking about. This ball must be moved forward because there will always be opposition when as a church and as a culture, as a society, when we want to engage the culture, there will always be naysayers. Always be people who come against you because what you're trying to do, no matter what it is, no matter how good it is, people will talk about you. I want to take you to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Let's talk about a man here. A man in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Hey, let me just tell you. Every time, look at me for a moment. Every time there was trouble in the world, God will raise up a voice. A man, a woman. Martin Luther King Jr. stood against the giant of Jim Crow. Corey Tim Boom stood against fascism and Nazi Germany. In the era of the revitalists, there was John Wesley and the Great Awakening. In the era of the Reformation, there was Luther and Calvin and the Anabaptists. Watch this. In the Roman era, there was a man named Polycarp and the martyrs. These were in the lineage of John the Baptist. 
the prophetic voice in the wilderness. We can no longer be the pathetic voice. We must be the prophetic voice of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, who echoed Ezekiel and the biblical prophets, God was looking, and he's still looking for an Ish and an Isha, looking for someone willing to die for what they believe. City of Chicago want, uh, did not want uh, a restaurant to come here to our city in, in our ward, in the first ward. And the mayor did not welcome Chick-fil-A. I don't know if, how many remember that in the news. And so I was in Washington, D.C., and I said through the media, I said, the mayor doesn't speak for everybody. And the mayor does not have my moral value system at so he does not speak for me. Chick-fil-A is welcome here. So then I called the president of Chick-fil-A, called him on his cell phone. I said, listen, it's a fight, but we're going to fight. So then I called the alderman who kind of in, introduced the bill to stop Chick-fil-A. And I called him. I said, listen, you and I need to meet in the park. That's how we do it in the city of Chicago. <laughs> That's how we do things here in the city. I don't know how you do it in your state. And we meet in the park, and my wife is with me, and I said, babe, you may want to stay out of this for a moment. I say, hey, we've been friends for many years. I've supported you and believe you've been in my church several times. Your wife came out of my church, yada, 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 yada. But I'm, you're about to go down. This is a fight you do not want to have. Back off. And it just looked like, like in the park by a tree. <laughs> like that's how things were being negotiated. In the city of Chicago, in one of our high schools, a teacher threw the Bible in the garbage. True. Doesn't hit the press. He took up the Bible and says, this Bible is nothing. Doesn't mean anything. And he threw it right in the garbage can. In front of his class. What he did not know was that there was a student who went to our church. Texted his father. You would not believe what just happened here. This guy just threw the Bible in the garbage. His father calls me. I get in my car. I go to the school. I go see the principal. She says, hey, how you doing? Not good. <laughs> we got a problem. We have a problem. Here's what happened. I told her, bah, 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 go get the teacher. I want to talk to him. Meanwhile, my blood, this is what happens. It's the Puerto Rican blood. My blood is boiling. But it's not only, it, 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 it was much more than that. It's because how they've treated the Christians and what you and I believe in. We can no longer be a rug. I mean, there, there comes a time where you're going to have to stand for your standards, for what you believe. Come on, somebody here. You can't just be a Christian on Sunday and Monday through Saturday. Everyone's going to hell. I said, go get the teacher. I'm praying meanwhile because that's what pastors do. We pray. In my mind, I'm hoping, I'm thinking that the teacher will come in and say, no, it was a math book. I was just playing. That's what I was hoping. He comes in, tall, atheist. Comes into the room, introduce myself. My name is Pastor Choco. Da -da -da. Told him, sit down. Sit down. The principal sat right next to him. And I don't know how you deal with things in your city, but right, the Bible says that we're the head, not the tail. Yet for 40 years in this nation, come on, somebody, for 40 years in this nation, we've been acting like the tail. I said, sit down. I just found out that you just did, ba, ba, ba. did you throw the Bible in the garbage? Today? And now, meanwhile, it was like all heaven stopped for a moment. And, and I'm hoping that he would say no. And then he says, yes, I did. And then I looked at him and I said, how dare you? For thousands of years, people have died for this. And I just started throwing him scud missiles. Ba, 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 I take you out. <laughs> And I said to him, I said to him, because I'm a pastor, I'm going to give you an opportunity to repent. 
you go back to your classroom, get the Bible out of the garbage, and repent before your class. Turn to the principal, get on the intercom, and tell all the teachers to respect the Bible. And I look among them for a man who will stand in the Ibanayim. And God said, I didn't find anybody who was willing to risk their life, their reputation. We have come to a time in our society where God is looking. 1 Samuel chapter 17 speaks about a young man. His name is David. Watch this. David was a shepherd. He protected the sheep. You know that. He fought against the bear and the lion. You know that. He could discern when something was threatening his sheep. Hey, let's just, let's just go back and visit the story just for really quick. Where's David? At David, when the prophet comes to the house, the prophet comes to anoint the king. David's taking care of the sheep. The father brings all the boys. Prophet says, I think it's this one. God said, don't, don't pick what's outside, Papa. I don't look outside. I look for people with their heart. He's not the one. He's tall, dark, and he's handsome, but he's not the guy. And he went down the list, and he says, none of them. The prophet looked to the father and said, you got another boy? He said, yeah, I got a son. His name is David. He's over there. He must smell like a sheep. Bring him in. Brings in David. Watch this. God said, this is the boy. He's the king of Israel. Anoint him. And he anoints him. He anoints him. And what does David do? Notice the scripture. David returns back to the sheep. You may have been anointed to do a mighty work of God, but you must return to the sheep. You cannot stop smelling like a sheep, no matter what, how, oh, come on, somebody. No matter how far God takes you, you cannot stop smelling like a sheep. David returns back to the sheep, and it's with the sheep that he's in private with God. Private things will come out in public one day. His devotional life. The Bible says that he killed the bear and the lion. How did he kill the bear and the lion? Because God was with him. God was raising a young man, preparing for him for the public life. And you got to at least know that his devotional life was in private. Watch this. To be able to discern that a bear and a lion, David's ears... We're in tune as he was sleeping. Shh, shh, shh. I hear somebody. I hear somebody. I think it's a bear. And he picks up his slingshot. I must defend what God has given me. Even if it is a bear. Even if it is a lion. I must defend. Because, oh, listen, listen, at the end of the day, y'all, church, all God wants you to do is to show up. He's going to kill the bear and the lion. Come on. Don't kid yourself. It's not going to be you and I. It was just be when you just show up, then the river opens up. And bear came and David killed the bear. The lion came and then David killed the lion. But meanwhile, he was doing what he was called to do. And sometimes in ministry, you just keep doing it. Don't try to rush God's hand. One day his father said, hey, David, I've got an assignment for you, boy. I need you to go see your brothers. They're fighting with Saul, King Saul. Watch this. And the Bible says that his father gives him a piece of bread and a piece of cheese. In America, we call that cheese sandwich. I don't know what it was in the biblical term, but we call that cheese sandwich. I need you to go take this cheese sandwich to your brothers. I want you to check up on them and then come back with me. Come back to me with a report. Mind you, he's the anointed king. Mind you, he was doing things in private. That God was preparing him for a public. Watch this, watch this. He gets to the battle line. Stop here. If you're taking notes, for 40 days, the people of Israel will line up. To fight. Did you hear me? 40 days. Put on the armor. Woo, ready, let's go. And the, and the king would say, retreat. Because Goliath would come out. <laughs> and they would fall back to their tents. And they'd go back to their houses. 
And the next morning, they do the same thing. The next morning, go back and forth. Back and forth. It's like, it's like going to church. It's like going to church and dressed up, carrying the Bible, but don't do no battle. What value is it that you may know verses, but you don't know the author? Because what you know in the Bible should move you to do. Watch this. Watch this. 40 days. I want to tell you here in America, for 40 years, laws have been created. And the church, silent. We've been going to our churches. We've been going to have our services. And God is looking for a man and a woman, somebody who would stand up in City Hall. Somebody said, no, not in my watch. City of Chicago wanted to build the first gay high school. Go ahead and Google it. You'll see my name up there. And the gay community came after me. Started calling me names. He's homophobic. I was in New Mexico. City of Chicago. Arnie Duncan. Called him. Arnie, we got to meet. I flew in to Chicago. Went downtown to his conference room. Arnie, we have a problem. You can't build that. He said, well, Reverend De Jesus, you have no idea. These people, these people, the, the gay community have been harassed and they've been bullied and da, 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 da. He's giving me a list of things of what they're going through. And I stood up in the back of the conference. I said, are you kidding me? Our girls are being harassed. Our, our girls are being harassed because they're virgins. They're being harassed by guys and girls. Our kids are being harassed, our Christian kids, because they wear T-shirts that says Jesus lives. And you're telling them to turn it around. You're telling them not to pray for their lunch. Arnie, I'm prepared. And I remember, stood up. I said, Arnie, I'm prepared to go to prison for this. What are you prepared to do? He said, Reverend, sit down. I said, no, I'm not sitting down. <laughs> Sick and tired of how people take to church. I said, Arnie, if you're going to build one school for them, I need 20 schools for our Christian kids who are being harassed, who are being bullied. Then I need one school for kids who suffer from obesity, who are being harassed and laughed at. Then I need another school for the Muslim kids. And finally, after three months, they're like, oh, forget it. We're not building the school. And I look among them for someone who will stand. And I didn't find anybody. Because what value is it that you're a Christian and it doesn't move you and you play it safe? It's no longer playing it safe. It's no longer cute and romantic and lift our hands and worship the Lord. That's awesome. We need to do that. Worship the Lord. But that must be moving. David takes his cheese sandwich and he goes up to his brothers. Says, hey, what's up, man? Papi wants to know how you guys are doing. Yeah, he's just checking up. And there's a cheese sandwich. Todo bien? Everything's good? Yeah, everything's good. And then watch this. Watch this. Then David hears something that he heard before. The lion and the bear. What he hears is threat. What he hears is something that moves in his spirit that's not right. It's not right. And he turns around. He turns around. And watch this. David never, read the scripture. David never recognizes Goliath as a giant. What he recognizes him is an uncircumcised Philistine. How dare you come before the army of God? He didn't even say the army of Saul. He said the army of God. Now I know why. You know why the problem we have in chapter 17? Because Saul didn't take care of it in chapter 15. Whatever you don't kill today, your grandchildren would have to face it. Because you didn't have the courage. Your children's children would have to face it. God told Saul, kill everybody. Had he killed Goliath, David, a teenage boy, would not have to meet him in chapter 17. And by the way, Goliath is not born a giant. He was a baby. Should have killed him when he was a baby. We got to kill things in this land while they're babies. And just because things are legal, it doesn't mean it's ethical. That's where you and I come in. Thus saith the Lord. Watch this. David, 
David looks to the giant. He looks towards Goliath. And watch this, watch this. Goliath turns around and he says, hey, send me your man. Not only is God looking for a man, but so is the devil. The devil himself is saying, hey, 40 days, you guys are all punks. Give me one guy, anybody. Send me your man. The devil's champion comes out, out of formation, and he says, give me one guy. Give me your guy. Who's the anointed? Whoever it is, I don't care. That's Goliath's attitude. But he didn't know that on that day, there was a cheese sandwich carrier, an anointed king, an anointed king who killed the bear and the lion. He didn't know that that day 41 was going to be a different day. Goliath stood there, said, send me your guy, and God sends his champion, David. Go ahead, David. Come on. Go in there. Take care of him. The Bible says he picks up five stones. You know the story. He really only needed one, but the other, the other four were for his brothers. He picked up one. He picked up one stone. And all God really wanted was to see if David would really throw it. Come on, just think about the velocity of the, the rock, how fast it has to go to hit him and to knock him down. It's only God, but God. Watch this. I'm getting to the point here. He takes the rock. You better look at these things in your life. Because these giants are, are rising up in your kid's life. In your daughter's life. And you, they think it's cute. And if you don't kill it. If you don't kill it now. That habit. That addiction. It's going to grow. And it's coming after you. The Bible says that he threw the rock. And he knocked down Goliath. He didn't kill him. He knocked him down. But what does David do? David says, I got to finish this job. Watch this. Watch this. Read the scripture. And David said, I got to finish what I started. And the Bible says he got rid of the cheese sandwich. And he took the sword of the giant. And he cut his head off. Watch this. When he cut the head of the giant when he cut the head of the habit, when he cut the head of this addiction in his life, when you cut the head off, when you talk about resurgent, you think the Bible says that when David cut the head off and he turned towards the people of Israel, the Bible says then the people of Israel surged. Forty days lining up, looking like Christians. Looking the par, but no one has the audacity to go kill the giant. And when you do it, dad, mom, when you kill that giant at that public school, when you stand for what you believe, your children will surge. Your children, your children will get excited because of what you stood for. Forty days, forty nights. Mocked the Lord. We must, listen to me church, we must act. You can no longer stay in the sideline. You must get engaged. You must tell your pastors, I'm in. Let's go fight. I'm in. And if I die, I die. Look in the Bible. Look in the Bible. Hey church, everybody, before you decide to get in, be prepared to die. Dr. King, they killed him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, 1945, killed him. John the Baptist killed him. Every single woman and man that stands for something, be prepared to die. And then the ultimate gap person is Jesus. He stood in the gap between heaven and hell. He came on this planet earth for society. And even while he was on the cross between two thieves, he was still in the gap. And they killed him because he stood for what he believed. Stand with me for a moment. Stand with me for a moment. Watch this. Stay right where you're at. You must be willing to engage. You're 18 years old. You're 40 years old. 
You're 70. Age does not have a problem with God. God said, I look among them for someone who would risk their life. And I didn't find that one person. Hey, look at me. I like what Dr. King says. Can I read it to you, his quote? Dr. King said this. Courage is an inner resolution to go forward despite obstacles. Cowardness is submissive surrender to circumstances. Courage breeds creativity. Cowardness represses fear and is mastered by it. Cowardness asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it political? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But the conscience asks the question, is it right? And listen to me, church. And there comes a time when you and I must take a position that's neither safe, nor political, nor popular. But one must take it, but because it's right. You know what changed Nehemiah's life forever? When he was in the city of Susa? When he asked the question, how's Jerusalem? From that point on, his life changed forever. And if you're not willing to do anything about the answer, don't ask the question. How's Jerusalem? Hananiah said, oh, you want to know? It's a mess. Women are being raped. Food is being stolen. Why? Because with revelation comes responsibility. And Nehemiah felt, I can no longer be in the huddle. I've got to do something to fix the walls of this city. And that question that he asked thousands of years ago, you got to ask it. How's, how's Chicago? How's L.A.? How's South Africa? How's Haiti? How's Santo Domingo? God is looking. That's why I wanted to come here tonight. To provoke your spirit. To mess you up. It's not cute just only to be a Christian on Sundays. You must stand for what you believe. And if you go down, go down. But God is with you. The God of Abraham is with you. And he says, I'm looking for anybody. Is there a woman, anybody in Chicago, anybody that's looking on the internet, anybody who would say, I'll stand. I'm going to stand. And if I die, I die. But I cannot continue on in my Christian journey and allow things to happen and me stay silent. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Who? Who here tonight would say, I need to stand in the Ibanayim. If I'm going to surge, if I'm going to encourage my family, my children, my son, my daughters, if I'm going to encourage them, I must risk my life. No more playing it safe. There must be someone. With every head bowed and every eyes closed, all over this sanctuary. Yeah, 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 yeah. We adore you, Lord. You are worthy, you are worthy, you are worthy, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Love you, Lord. And I look among them to see who will stand for me. How many of you here at the sound of my voice will say, Pastor Choco, you're preaching tonight. Mess me up. I can't play it safe no more. I can't be in the huddle for five years, ten years, talking big stuff. I must engage. There are issues in my community. And I must rebuild the walls of our city. Pray for me. Oh, Sota Karababush. Pray for me that God would use me. I don't care if you're a teenager. I don't care if you're an adult. 
God is saying, I'm looking for anybody, a man, a woman, anybody who will stand for me. I can pour out my blessing upon them. If that's you here tonight, a tsunami's coming. Giants are in the land, and God is looking for giant killers. Pray for me, Pastor Choco. Lift your hands if that's you quickly, quickly, all over this place. I don't know where you're from. I don't know what your church you go to. We're not asking you to join our church here. We're saying, would you join in the battle? There's a war. If you raise your hand right now, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to get out of your seat and come. And come. You have been anointed. Come, come. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We adore you, Lord. You were anointed to kill giants. You were not anointed to carry a cheese sandwich. You were anointed to kill giants. Stand for what you believe. Kill those giants. Lift them up, God. You've anointed them to kill giants. Oh, Santo. To worship you, God. Kill the giants. Stand for what you believe. God, give her a spirit of boldness. No more spirit of fear than timid. Give her words. Give her words to speak, God. Give her clarity. Yahweh, Yahweh, in the name of Jesus, Santo, yes, Lord, kill giants, kill them, you are anointed not to be a cheese sandwich carrier. Cut the head off of that giant. Spirit of boldness. Words. In the name of Yahweh. Bless my brother. Give him St. Louis. Hand it over to him. Hand it over to him. Fresh in his belly. Spirit, anoint him, God, in the name of Jesus. God, you called them to be giant killers. Bless them. Anoint them, God, in the name of Jesus. Kill the giants in your families. Kill the giant in the life of your children. Kill them in the name of Jesus. If you don't kill them, your grandchildren would have to face them. Boldness come upon you. In the name of Jesus. Kill the giants. Lift your hands right now. Lift your hands. No more on the sidelines. No more playing it safe. Put your life on the line. If you do that, you will live. If you do that, you will live. No more existing. God has called you to live. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Giant killers. Giant killers in the name of Jesus. Giant killers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, lift your hands right now all over this place. Those who are watching on the internet, 
We invite you to come tomorrow. Would you lift your hands for a moment? The presence of God is in this place. Right now, God is revealing to you giants in your life, in your community. And you've been saying, God, something has to happen. And God's saying, I've been trying to get a hold of you. You've been looking over the fans. I've been trying to call you. I'm talking to somebody here tonight. Come on, begin to tell the Lord tonight. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. If there's going to be a surging, it's going to require that my life be in. If there's going to be a surging, a resurgent. And the Bible says, in the people of Israel surged. be people of God. There must be. I want you to look at me for a moment. Look at me. You were anointed. Whenever it was in your mother's womb, you were anointed to kill giants. And we've allowed these giants to enter into our society, our homes, but no more. You're not anointed to, ki- to carry a cheese sandwich. You're anointed to engage. Engage. If you don't, your grandchildren will. And I looked among them for a man, a woman, who will stand in the Ibanayim. And God said, I didn't find that one person. May he find several hundreds of you standing in the Ibanaya. Just a few more moments of worship. Come on, just cry out to God. Those giants are dead in your life. You're the head and not the tail. Come on, church, just tell them, just tell them. What do you live for? Some people live for money. Some people live for their job. Some people live for their house. Some people live for their cars. Some people live for the family. Who do you live for? to worship God. Live for God. Live for God. Live for God. We worship you, God.
giant killer. Worshippers are giant killers. Worshippers are giant killers. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. There's power in your worship. 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 Jesus, I need you, Jesus. Deliverance come upon you. someone here today God is speaking to you right now nobody looking around nobody seeing you're just worshiping right now that you need deliverance deliverance from an addiction you've been struggling for years to kill it and God says today you will kill that giant God is going to deliver you completely today. Today's your day. The man of God spoke on killing the giant. You're saying, Pastor, I need to be delivered. You ain't got to tell us what it is. There's no shame in it. You're just saying, I need to be delivered. It could be from drugs. It could be from pornography. Whatever the case may be, it doesn't matter. The enemy has shackled you. He has thought that's how he was, was a cheese sandwich carrier. But God says you're a giant killer. You will kill that giant today. Today you will carry the head. If that's you here today, come on. Make your way. 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 Come on. Come on. Brian, come on. Anybody else? Make your way. Come on. We got some pastors that are ready. It's giant killing day. It's addiction killing day. Just push your way through like the woman with the issue of blood. She made her way through. You need to kill that addiction. Come on. Make the room. Bring them through. Bring them through. Who else? Come on. There's no shame in it. Addiction. God is calling you right now. Freedom. 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 Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. There's an addiction releasing right now. Freedom. 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 This is the sound of freedom. This is what you're hearing right now. The sound of freedom. Somos libre en Jesús. Lo que está escuchando ahora mismo, ese sonido, que somos libre. We are free. We are free. We are free. If you're watching on the internet, you need freedom. Just raise your hand. I can't see you, but God can. You are free right now in Jesus' name. Si estás aquí y necesitas oración, pase. Queremos orar. Queremos orar. Porque servimos un Dios poderoso. If you need freedom, come on. Jesus. 
Jesus. The worship team is fighting for your freedom right now. It's fighting for your freedom right now. Jesus. 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 Come on, come on. There's a work being done right now. Don't leave the same way you came into this place. Don't let pride stop you. Jesus. The one that is in your mind, you wanted to quit. You want to give up. You come into this place because you've been defeated. You feel defeated. You feel like what pastor was talking about. You standing on the line. And the enemy has been mocking you. The enemy has been laughing at you. He's been mocking you. And you couldn't move. Come on, come on. Come on. The enemy's been mocking you. You couldn't move. And God says you are the one today that is going to stand in the gap. You are my David today that will stand up against the giant. No longer will you be mocked. No longer will you have a spirit of fear because we don't operate in fear. But God says he's given you a spirit of power, of love, and of sound mind. Is there anybody else? That's you. You feel like giving in. Come on, come on. Just make your way. Just make your way. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Pastors, just bring them. Yeah, bring them to the pastors. We're going to pray. We're going to get rid of that spirit of fear right now. It, you're not going to give up. You're not going to give up. Pase, pase. Dios nos ha dado un espíritu de temor. Si necesitas oración, pase. Dios puede cambiar tu situación ahora mismo. God can change it. No hay nada imposible para Dios. There's nothing impossible for God. Jesus. Come on, we wait on you, God. We wait on you. We wait on you, God. Yes, Lord. myself away the Lord is still speaking is there somebody here God has called you into the ministry God has called you into the ministry but fear has stopped you God has called you he has chosen you you've heard it you've seen it in your dreams and you don't understand what is happening. God is calling you to be a David right now. You are called to the ministry. You're called to the ministry. You're called to the ministry. God has been tugging at your heart and you haven't been understanding what's happening. I want to pray with you quickly. Get up out of your seat quickly. Quickly. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Pastor Lee. Come on. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Who else? Call to the ministry. Brian. Call to the ministry. Call to the ministry. Who else? Come on, come on. Who else? You're called to the ministry. You're a giant killer. You don't understand what's happening. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Pastor, come on. You're called to the ministry. 
You're called to the ministry. You just don't understand what's going on. But God is speaking to you. He's shaking you. I worship you, God. Come on, come on. God is doing something right now. This is a conference like none other. God is doing something right now. Come on, we're going to battle. We're going to battle. To worship you. There's a lady here struggling with her son. You've been crying over your son. You've been shedding tears for your son. And you've been asking, God, have you heard me for your son? Mom, if you're here, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Sandra, oh. crying for your son. Oh, Jesus. 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 Come on, come on. God is doing something right now. God is doing something right now. Lo que está pasando, Dios está moviendo ahora. God is moving right now. God is moving. Dios está moviendo aquí. God is moving. Porque hay poder en la palabra de Dios. There's power in God, in the word of God. Hay poder en la palabra de Dios. Solamente escucha la, la palabra de Dios. Just listen to the word of God. Y la palabra de Dios puede cambiar su vida. Puede cambiar su matrimonio. La palabra de Dios puede sanarte. The power of God, the word of God can save you. It can heal you. It can set you free. Ooh. There's someone here, you're looking for a job. You're looking for a job. You've been crying out to God. God, I need a job. I need a job. I've tried every situation. Every door has been closed in my life for that job. God is about to open it up. If that's you here today, you've been praying for that job. Praying for the job. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Come on, come on, come on. Praying for the job. Come on. Where are you today? Jesus. Father, right now. If that's you here today, just move. Just move. You've been praying for the job. Don't look around. God is about to open the door. You step out in faith and kill the giant. In Jesus' name. Oh, Jesus. If that's you on the internet, I pray for you right now. I pray for you right now for God to open up the door in Jesus' name. Oh, Jesus. Te esperamos en ti, Señor. We wait on you, God. Si hay alguien aquí que está orando por un trabajo, pase. Jesus, we worship you. We worship you, God. Come on. Jesus. Jesus. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. There's power. Let's come here. Pastor Elias, come here. He's been seeking. 
been watching and been desiring. He's just been afraid. Pray, pray. Jesus. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. When you have no words to say, Cuando no hay palabras, dile a Dios. Dile a Dios. You can say it in English. Puede decirlo en español. That represents your words. Your gap. Those letters fill in your gap for you right now. Jesus. Jesus. church there's a resurgence going on God is bringing something up out of you God is bringing it up out of you right now come on thank you Jesus somebody praise the Lord this evening as the lights come back on find two three people give them a hug tell them you love them in Jesus name Hallelujah. Find someone you don't know. Introduce yourself to them. Tell them you love them. Tell them welcome to the house of God. God is good. Amen. We're so glad that you made it here tonight. Know that if you don't have a place to worship tomorrow morning, the conference continues here at 11 a.m. Pastor Elias is going to be speaking the word. You don't want to miss it. If you have a house of worship, then you go there. You worship. And if you don't have services Sunday night, 7 p.m. is totally dedicated. We're, we're praying. We've been praying and fasting for healing. So you bring people in wheelchairs. You bring people in crutches. You bring people who've been diagnosed with cancer, with back problems, with headaches, whatever the case may be. You bring them Sunday night, and we're going to anoint them, and we're going to believe in healing. If you believe that, say amen. The Word of God tells us this. He didn't say go pray for the sick. He said go heal the sick. So we're going to heal the sick Sunday night. We're going to heal the sick Sunday night. Amen. We're not going to pray about it. We're not going to talk about it. Amen. We're going to heal the sick. We're going to preach the Word. And we're going to heal the sick. Amen. So get your expectors ready. Those that are sick in your bodies, get ready to receive a miracle tomorrow. Because we serve a God of miracles. Amen.
You heard from the man of God. Fill this place with sick, with the wounded. Bring them, compel them, drag them, pull them by the ear, whatever you got to do. Get them to the house of God. And remember, the night service starts at 7. We've been starting at 7.30 the other nights, but we're going to start Sunday night and finish it off. We're starting at what time? 7. 7. That's American time. Amen. We need you here at 7 o'clock. Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. You can, uh, if you have a house of worship to go to, you go to that house, you be faithful. But Sunday night, if you do not have a place, you can come here and bring in everybody. Everybody. Because we're going to see miracles take place in Jesus' name. Amen? I pray that you've enjoyed this conference. Um, I don't know if Pastor Via is around. I know he kind of was doing some things for me. So but if not, that's fine. I, I'll dismiss uh, this evening. Just close your eyes with me. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray that you bless those that are here today. God, that they would go home safely, Lord. That they would share their testimonies of what they saw and what took place to them personally with those around them, Father. God, and those that do not have a house of worship, God, that they could be here tomorrow, at, Father, at 11 a.m. to worship you, to hear the voice of God through the prophet of God. God, and I ask right now, take everyone home safely, never from your presence, God, but from this facility, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. And the people of God say, amen. amen. Greet one another in the name of the Lord. God bless you. We love you in Jesus' name.